Last night, the lights went out and Charles Barkley goes, you have, the, you have your TV on the clapper? <laughs> Yeah, I used to, I thought if you got one of those when you were younger, you were rich. Then I realized, no, you're not. It was just, you ever seen that? Clap on, clap off, the clap. Uh, I was playing until one day I actually farted and the lights went off. I was like, all right. Okay. If you just tap it, put your finger on it, tap it, and you're like. Because it hears the sound? Oh, yeah, I remember those. Yeah, yeah. Those, those lamps would do that? You thought, see, I, I thought that we were rich if we did that. Like, that was yeah, it. Yeah, 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 like that, the fade. We called it the fade in and out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You just do that? I told my mom it fades in and out. She's like, no, that's what you do with your hair. <laughs> Okay, so listen, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 4 today. Uh, we're going to talk about Paul, and Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 4 the ministry of apostleship. So we're going to look at it from Paul's perspective, um, the cost of living uh, this life, what it looks like. Um, yeah, well, we're going to see some of what Paul was going through, some of what Paul was feeling. He hasn't been in the has he? No, he has not. You've seen our taxes, Paul. <laughs> so 1 Corinthians 4. So um, we're actually going to go through all of 1 Corinthians 4, and then we're going to touch a little bit in 2 Corinthians chapter... Let me make sure I get it right so I don't lose it. 2 Corinthians, a little bit of chapter 11 and chapter 12. So let's start with 1 Corinthians 4. So uh, since we're going to read the whole chapter, I'm going to read it bit by bit and explain it. So uh, just remember, this is Paul's letter to the Corinthians. So what Paul always did, we kind of talked about last week, Paul would go from, on his mission trip, he would start at one point, and he was, every time he would stop, he would go to synagogue first. Traditionally, well, he just always get kicked out of the synagogue, thrown out. Then he will go and teach the gospel, and people will come to believe, and he will start a church right there with Gentile believers. And then Paul will go to the next town. So Paul will stay about one to two years and do that in each town. But Paul will always get reports of what's happening in each of the churches that he started. And Paul will write back letters to them, either encouraging them or rebuking them, whatever. Um, and the thing about Paul, every letter he wrote, it was about what was going on in the church. And he always brought things back to the gospel. And so Paul will also, after he finished his journey, he will circle back around and stop at each church individually until he got arrested in Jerusalem and thrown in jail and sent to Rome where he later died. So uh, Paul starts this off with, this is how we should guard uh, well, a little background. Paul is dealing with people are saying Apollos. They're following Apollos. People are saying they're following Paul. And so there's a little conflict in the church because people are saying, no, we're with Paul or with Apollos. And Paul was saying, no, you're a Christ, not of a particular man. And so when Paul gets to this, he just kind of laid that down in chapter three. And in chapter four, he starts home with this is how we should regard. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In other words, you shouldn't look at me and Apollos like we're these great mighty men or God himself. You should look at us as servants of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards, people who serve and handle things with care. They should be faithful. So the first thing Paul kind of hints is, is here, uh, for a steward of Christ, someone who is serving of Christ, you have to be faithful. Now, when you talk about being faithful, you're talking about enduring. You're talking about not giving up. You're talking about um, being steadfast. You're talking about seeking the Lord's will, doing His will. You're not talking about um, the faithfulness of, as long as things are going good, I'm with you. When things go bad, I'm done. Paul is saying you have to be faithful. If anyone's going to serve God and be a steward of God, they should be found to be faithful, enduring staying, trustworthy, honorable. But what to me is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time. For the Lord comes who will bring to light the things now hidden in the darkness and will disclose with purpose of the heart that each one will receive his commendation from God. I have appealed all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, so that you may learn, learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in the favor against one another. For who says anything different of you? What do you have that you do not receive? You received it. Why do you boast as if you did not receive it? So this is what Paul is saying right here. One, a steward is faithful, but two, we can't, he's still saying we can't judge. He says, listen, you can't even judge me. I can't really even judge myself. Now remember, to judge just means to separate from righteous and sinner, right? If we start telling people, um, 
Now, once again, this is not going against people's sin. If you see sin, you hold people accountable to it. But when we're talking about righteous, we're talking about judging. We're saying that in the end, God ultimately judges. And that when we're judging people on this earth, telling them, well, you're hell bound. There's no hope for you. We're ultimately saying there's no way that they're going to change. There's no way that God can intervene in a situation. There's no way that things are going to get better or different. It's always going to be like that. They're always going to be that person. They're bound for hell and that's it. And Paul is saying we cannot do that. Now, can we hold each other accountable? And, I mean, if you read through 1 Corinthians 4, Paul does that. Yes. Can you call sin, sin? Yes. But I can't say there's no hope. There's hope for everybody. Um, even if it seems bleak, as long as we're breathing and living on the earth, we have hope. Um, and so Paul tells them, you can't pronounce judgment before the time. Right? You can't judge people. Now, what I know I struggle with at times is judging the intent of people's hearts. Right. Because we look at their actions and we say, you know what, this is what they really meant. Or we hear words that they say uh, or we get a text from them or we see something on Facebook or we hear what they said. And we immediately go into our, our own little private corner and we do detective work and realize, well, this is what they really mean. This is what they were trying to say. And Paul is saying you can't do that, especially those who are teaching the gospel, especially those who are following Christ. We can't judge them before their time, because in the end, God is going to disclose everything that we did. Can you imagine that standing before the throne of God and everything you've ever thought, every intent in your heart, every action gets exposed? Right. Paul is saying, listen, that's none of us are going to be free from that. The Apostle Paul is going to stand before the throne of God and his actions are going to get presented before us, too. His intentions of his heart are going to be presented before God. So even those dark intentions where, I, you know, you ever did something really nice for somebody, but you didn't really want to do it. You, get, you have some arterial motives or you say something to make somebody feel something, feel bad a little bit. But you say it in a nice way. In St. Louis, we call it uh, <laughs> nicety. We really do. It's when you, you're talking real nice, but you're saying horrible things and mean things to the person. And, and they can tell, but you're saying it in a nice way so it looks like you're loving. But the other day, somebody cut, I got cut off. Mm -hmm. I sat here and said, wow, you got a real a -hole. I was like, whoa. Thank you, sir. I've worked long and hard to get that reputation. <laughs> right, right. You know, I didn't say anything bad because people right. with me. I just told him, well, thank you. I've worked long and hard right. to get that reputation. Mm -hmm. I'm more irritated that he didn't get my get under my skin than right. the alias. They're like, what? Right, because some people intend to do that, but they say it in a way to get you riled up. Um, one of one of the uh, things from one time a friend told me is, if you're in an argument, and you're screaming, and yelling, and the other person is calm, you don't look like a fool, and you could be right. Right. But some people have that intention of, of, of purposely saying things to get you upset. And God says, listen, in the end, that's going to be exposed. Uh, people who come to church just to come to church. God says in the end, that's going to be exposed. Nothing will be hidden. And so Paul says you can't judge someone until that time. Because sometimes you have good intentions, but your actions come out horrible. My grandma, my grandma had a you don't have to slap somebody physically to slap them. That's right. That's right. And Paul is saying all that will be exposed. Then it says in the end, each will receive his commendation, com, commendation before the Lord from God. So in other words, in the end, God will reward us all. Right. There, there is hope in the end and there's reward that we all will get. So one that makes us see that all this is worth it. Right. Um, we're not looking for rewards here on earth. We're not looking for the pat on the back. And Paul gets in a little bit of that later. We're looking just to serve God. And in the end, the glory that we get is when we're with him. Now, Paul goes on and says this, and I've applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor against one another. But who sees anything different in you? What, did you? what do you have that you did not receive, that you received it? Why do you boast that you did not receive it? So Paul is saying all these gifts that you have, all, these, all this talent, the information that you got, the knowledge that you got. Listen, this, you didn't, this isn't your own doing. Right. Um, I remember being younger and bragging about how much money my dad made. Right. I remember that because we had, you know, we, we didn't have it all in the beginning. But as he got older and got promoted in the company, man, at at t it was great. We enjoyed, we enjoyed some luxuries. It was nice. I mean, we had money. It, it, when you don't have money and then you have it, it's a little different, isn't it? Listen, money doesn't change you. But it does change your address sometimes, right? It does change what's in your bank account. But I remember I was bragging about what we had. And my dad, you know, he helped me to realize something. He was like, you know, no, no, listen, I'm rich. You're poor. 
I'm just taking care of you. You're in my house, right? This money, this stuff that you're bragging about, this is mine. This is a gift, right? It, it, it would be like if, if I brag, if my kids started bragging about, oh, we got an Xbox One. No, daddy's got an Xbox One. It's a gift to you. Right. You can't brag about something that you didn't that you didn't earn, something that you didn't work for. Not that we should brag at all. Paul's making the point that every gift that you have in the church of Corinth has been given to you by God. The knowledge you have about God, the which have you grown in Christ, that's all given to you by God and God alone. So what is their reason to boast? As Christians, we have no reason to boast about anything because God gave us everything. God blessed us. God took care of us. God provided for us. Our walk with Christ is stronger because of him. And so there is never a need as us as Christians to boast over anybody. And Paul is making this assertion really loud because if anyone has room to boast, it should be this guy. But he's saying, no, there is no room to boast for something that was given to you freely. So that's why we as Christians are always humble, always humble, never prideful. I, I, I can't look down on anybody because without Christ, I'm, I'm probably worse off than you. Like it hits me sometimes. That without Jesus, I, I am worse off than you are right now. So I can't boast about anything. I can't boast about how long I'm walking with the Lord. I can't boast about how righteous I am, how many times I pray, how many times I read the Bible, how many people I saw come to the Lord. The Lord did this to me, he did that to me. Paul is saying there's no, there's no room for boasting to anything. Because without Christ, you have nothing. Right? So I am not as good as I think I am. But because of Christ, I am who I am. As he goes on, he says, already you have what you want. Already you become rich. Without us you, be, without us, you have become kings. And would that you do reign as we might share the rule with you. For you think that God has exhibited us as apostles as last of all men. Like men sentenced to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we are in disrepute. To the present hour we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. We labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we endure treat we have become and still like the scum of the world the refuse of all things now if i read that to you as a job description would you want to take that job you're the refuse of all the world the scum buffeted is not like a buffet line buffeted means you get pounded in the face violence <laughs> well, you might <laughs> You're poorly dressed, right? You hunger and you thirst. You're, you're the spectacle not only to angels but to men. You're considered a fool. You're not held in honor. You're held in dispute and dishonor. You're hungry. You're thirsty. You're barely even clothed. You're slandered. You're persecuted. This is the calling. Sounds like the president. Right. This, this is the calling. This is the calling. Now listen, go to... Uh, First, Second Corinthians chapter 11. And Paul gets a little more detail of the suffering he's talking about, what this actually looks like. Because, you know, sometimes we can say, well, you know, I'm, I've been mistreated. I've been this. I've been that. But Paul describes in first, Second Corinthians chapter 11, uh, starting at verse 16, when he talks about boasting. Now, verse 16 on down, we'll get into it a little bit. It says, I repeat, let no one think me foolish, but even if you do, accept me as a fool so that I may boast a little. Why am I saying this boast of confidence? I say not as the Lord will, but as a fool. <clears throat> so Paul's saying, when he's about to boast about himself, this is how a fool will talk. Since my boast according to the flesh, I will still, I too will boast. For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. For you bear someone makes you slaves of you, or devours you, and takes advantage of you, and puts you on airs or strikes in your or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say we were too weak for that. But whatever anyone dares to boast, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am the better one. I am talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I had the hands of the Jews, the forty lashes, less one. 
Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. And a night and a day, I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at the at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many sleepless nights, and hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is a daily pressure on me on my anxiety of, for all the churches who is weak for I am too weak who is made to fall am I not indignant now that's what Paul was describing in 1 Corinthians 4 that's the kind of life he endured for the sake of the cross always enduring that for the sake of the cross being stoned the, the 40 uh, the three the, the lashes he's talking about when they beat Jesus with the cat nine tails, Paul got that three times. Three times. You're not supposed to get it three times. You're supposed to really just get it once. He got that three times. Um, being stranded at sea. Danger from everybody. Robbers, his own people, Gentiles, the city, the wilderness, shipwreck, left overnight. All these things, this is what Paul has endured as a servant for Christ. This is what the life looks like. Paul had no intention of becoming famous or being known. Paul had no intention of, um, of writing a bestseller or, or getting people's money. Paul's only intention was to further the message of the gospel. And this is what it cost him. Ultimately, this is what it will cost us to share the message of the gospel. This is what it looks like. And then Paul says this, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness, that God and the Father of the Lord Jesus, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. At Damascus, the governor under King Arterius was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. Now, I'm sure if I was Paul, I would have said, how much more, Lord? How much more do I have to endure for your sake? I'm sure that's what he was thinking. In the midst of, of this suffering that he had on the outside, Paul goes on in chapter 12 and says, I must go on boasting. There is nothing to be gained by it. I will go into visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man who in Christ 14 years ago was caught up to third heaven with a body, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, uh, which, may not, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast except for my weakness. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it. So that one may think of me, one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited of the surpassing greatness of revelation, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger from Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should be, leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weakness, insults, harshness, persecutions, and calamities. For I am weak, then I am strong. Now, if you think after going through all that physical torment, that in the sense, God would give Paul a break, right? You would think that there would be, you know, some kind of relaxation. And you would think that that kind of life, being, being thrown into sea, being beaten, being stoned, being hit with whips, that that would humble a man. But the Lord says, to keep you humble, I give you a thorn in your side. Now, we don't know exactly what that is. We know it was it was it was someone in Paul's life that was a bother to him that God would not that God didn't give Paul any relief. But he says, huh? No, <laughs> he says, my grace is sufficient for you. Though. My power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul found this out that living this life may cost me, but it brings me closer to Christ. In all the weaknesses I am enduring, I am finding more and more about Christ. I'm coming closer to Him. I'm enjoying the fellowship of the suffering because I've come to know who Christ is. So he, he gladly takes hardships and persecutions and insults and calamities because in his weakness, he sees the strength of God. Listen, I, I, I heard this quote and I fully believe it for myself. My greatest moments of living the Christian life has not been when I appear to be the strongest. My greatest moments have appeared when I am the weakest and I have no choice but to fall on my face and say, God, I need you. Because in this life, that's what's going to happen. 
in this life, you will face moments like Paul is facing. We saw 2 Corinthians 12, and maybe 11, and even 12, and we see in 1 Corinthians 4. You're going to face these things sometimes on a daily, sometimes yearly. There is no timetable. There is no God's going to say, okay, you're going to suffer for five years. You're going to suffer for a year. However God deems long for us to suffer for his sake, to bring others to the cross, then that's how long we suffer. But like Paul, we can admit, God, this is a thorn in my side. Remove it or give me the grace to endure it. God, this is hard. This life is, um, I'm, I'm being talked about. I'm being lied on. I'm, I'm being dishonored. I'm, violence is coming against me. I am hungry. I am slandered against. But I endure it for the sake of the cross. Now, enduring it doesn't mean you just take it in like, oh, I'm not going to say anything. No, you, you got to be like Paul. You got to talk about this stuff. You have to admit that it hurts. You got to admit the pain and you allow God to give you the grace to endure it and heal you through it. Because I, I love how he ends in verse 12 when he says in chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians, when reviled, what does he do? He blesses. Right? When reviled, he, he you know, I mean, people are talking about it and Paul could clearly just come out and, and just lay everybody out. But he blesses instead. He blesses them. He's praying for them. When persecuted, he endures. You have to understand, to endure something, it, it doesn't mean you're just getting through. To endure means it's so great that you think about quitting. That you think about giving up and saying, I'm done. That's what it means to endure. The suffering is so intense that you, you think about quitting. Have you ever, I, it, well, I don't know the last time you guys have been to the gym. But I went to the gym again this week, right? And, <laughs> and I'm lifting. And... You know, the first time you go in there, you do the first couple of lifts, it feels like you're a champ. You know, so I would lift and I go run, lift, I go run. And the last time I'm coming back to lift and I just want to quit. Like the weight of it just felt too much. But if I want to build this muscle up, I've got to push through this part. I've got to let, because what happens when you're, when you're weightlifting, it tears all your muscle down on purpose. And then it builds it back up. And that's how you get stronger. Because your muscle realizes now, okay, so when we do this, we need to be stronger or else we can't do it. So I got to tear everything down to build it back up. But I have to endure it first. I have to push myself through it. And when you endure something, you're saying, I want to quit so bad. I want to give up. But I, I can't. I have to endure. Like when persecution comes, persecution makes you want to quit. When people talk about you, it makes you want to quit. When uh, you're lied on, it makes you want to quit. When you're reviled, it makes you want to quit. When you face violence for the sake of Christ, it makes you want to quit. But Paul is saying, endure. Because in the end, we're going to be where he is. We're going to be with Christ, our Savior, our Lord. It's worth it. So Paul says, endure. We endure. When slandered and people talk about us, they entreat them. They go to them. They offer them grace, offer them mercy. They, they, they offer them love. They don't, they don't take the slander and say, well, you said, right? Because we can get into those conversations real quick. Let somebody say something about you. You know, one of the famous sayings we had in college, keep my name out your mouth. That meant you talk about it one more time, it's going to be something, right? But Paul saying when you slander, no, you entreat them. You love on them. You show them mercy. And then he is with, we have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. When you say the refuse of all things, you're talking about the waste. You're talking about crap. That's what that means. You're the waste. You're the part that goes inside the body and the body says, I have no need of you. And you're thrown out. Paul is saying that's how people treat us. Like we're dumb, like we're worthless, like we should be in the toilet and flushed. That's what Paul is saying. But yet Paul endures. Right? Because our glory, our, our, our joy is not found in the things that we do. It's not found in this world. It's, it's found in Christ and Christ alone. Now, in saying that, listen, I, I know uh, heaven is, the, is where we want to be. But I always, always just want to make a point, something real quick. Heaven is not our Christ. Christ is our heaven. And what that means is we're not doing this so we can get to heaven. I'm not enduring this suffering so I can just sit up in heaven chilling. I'm, I'm doing this because I love my Lord. My Lord is my salvation. And wherever he is, I will be. And that's heaven for us. Now, Paul ends it with this, starting in verse 14. I do not write these things to make you ashamed. 
but to admonish you, my beloved children. In other words, Paul's saying, listen, I'm not saying this stuff to make you feel bad. I'm telling you because this is truth. I want to, I want to build you up. For though you have countless guys in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now, this is important that Paul brings this up. All right. Paul is saying that there are countless people out there now who are telling you about the gospel, leading and, and helping you understand this word more. But Paul says, I'm like a father to you. In other words, I'm like a mentor to you. I care for you. I want to shepherd you in the gospel. Because right now, if you want to know about Jesus, all you have to do is go to a Christian bookstore. Heck, you don't have to go to that now. You can go on Facebook and everybody's got a page. Um, you, I, I've seen everything from prophetess to ambassador to pastor to bishop to evangelist to missionist. What is a missionist? Missionary, um, brother Jones, sister Sherry. Everybody's got something. You, 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 you can go get. You can go to the movies and oh, here's a movie about Jesus. This was about Jesus. You just don't know it. This was about Jesus. This was about Jesus. It's everywhere. You don't have to go far to find it. You don't want to go to church one Sunday. You can live stream a church service. It's like everywhere. And Paul is saying, listen, but you need someone. To be like that father to you. Now, it's not to say like, you know, you my daddy, right? Please don't ever call me that. It's not to say that, okay? What Paul is saying, you need someone that you can honestly talk to, that can talk to you back. Someone that can tell you the truth of the gospel. Someone that can mentor you and disciple you. And Paul is saying, that's what I've been to you all. I, he, he could lead the church in Corinth and go play other churches because he knew they had the gospel. He knew they had leaders there. But Paul is saying, I am like a father to you. I'm here to disciple you, walk with you, and tell you the truth. We all need someone like that in our life. There's someone that's just going to sit there and just give us the ugly truth, the beautiful truth, and then, okay, let's pray about it. Let's walk together. Let me hold you accountable. Paul is saying, that's what I've been to you all. And that's what he'll continue to be. And he speaks as a father who loves his son, urging you then, in verse 16, I urge you then to be imitators of me. Right? Now, Paul is saying, look at my life. Now, remember, 2 Corinthians 12, this man got beaten all that stuff. Paul's saying, imitate all of that. All the suffering I do, all the persecution I do, I want you to imitate that. I want you to be like me. I want you to imitate the faith that I have. Not the flaws that I got. But the faith that I have in Christ, I want you to imitate that. Because what Paul is, is getting them ready for is, listen, to be like me, this is what you're going to have to endure too. Like this suffering is coming for you. He told Timothy in 2 Timothy, I believe, 4.13, he said, listen, endure suffering like a good soldier. Suffering has come for us all. Right? I, I look at my life sometimes and I see the things that I suffer for the sake of the cross. And I see people that I, I try to lead and help guide. And I all can think to myself is, one day it's coming for you too. It may not be today. So until that time, look at how I endured the suffering. See my faith in Christ. And when the time comes when you're suffering, imitate that. Imitate the faith that I had in Jesus. And Paul's encouraged them to do that. And he tells them, too, this is why I sent Timothy, my beloved faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ. So Timothy went to go preach to the church of Corinth to encourage them to build them up. And, the, and I teach them everywhere in every church. So Paul says, this is not something I just did out the whim, something I do now. Now, it, it, now Paul ends chapter four with the, with the warning shot. He says, some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon with the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God is not consistent in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or a love of the spirit of gentleness? So this is what Paul is saying. I am coming to you and I'm going to share the truth. Because people in the church of Corinth who were following Paulus, they were saying things like, Paul's not coming down here. I bet you Paul don't show up. Right? It, it, it's... It, it's kind of like they were running their mouths and they were like, Paul ain't going to do nothing. And so he sends Timothy and they're like, yep, Timothy showed up. I told you Paul ain't come down. He don't care about y'all. Paul ain't know what he's talking about. So Paul writes them and says, I'll be there. I'm going to show up. And I'm not going to show up with these lofty words. Now, now Paul is not going down there to just, you know, start knocking people up against the wall. Paul is going down there to show them, listen, transform lives are what matter. Lofty words mean nothing. 
It's, is your life transformed? That's what's important. That's what the kingdom of God is built on. This, this faith of your transformed life. Your life has been changed by the gospel itself. Not just some words you said because someone said say these things. Not just because you're praying and reading the Bible. But because your life has been transformed. In other words, you see this truth and it transforms you. Like, that's what's important. And listen, personally, that's what's important to me. I, I, it doesn't matter if you cry over a sermon or if you're offended by a sermon. It doesn't matter if, if, if we spend time talking and, and it hurts you or you, it makes you happy. All I care about is when you leave, is your life going to be transformed by that gospel message you just heard? Is it going to have some change on you? Right? If you tell a kid to clean a room, and they say, okay. And then you go sit down and the room's still dirty. And you come back and say, hey, clean your room. Clean my room. I'm going to do that. You said clean your room. Got you. And you go sit back down. And you get back up. The room still. What are you doing? I said clean your room. Yeah, I know. I heard that message. I received it. As a matter of fact, it touched me. Or, you know, I was a little offended when you said clean my room because you acknowledged my room was dirty. It bothered me. But I want to thank you for that. And they go back. I mean, what, what's the point? Right? And Paul is making, what's the point of these lofty words if, if nothing's going to happen? So Paul is saying, when I come down there, we're going to talk about this. And we're going to deal with it. And you have to understand, to be an apostle back in the day, if anyone spoke against an apostle, the apostles would go to their church and they would call them out and they would kick them out of the church. Reason being, the gospel is more important. Transformed lives are more important than people just saying lofty words or trying to get some authority. And Paul was saying, I'm not going to stand for that. So he, he, he asked him, how do you want me to come down there? I can come down there and clean up shop right now. I can come down there and, man, I, I will kick everybody out who's causing division and strife and, and is speaking this ill and not really following Christ. Or I can come down in the spirit of love and gentleness. So you can handle it. You can deal with it. All right? Look, Paul is giving a great example of what it's going to look like. What it looks like to serve the Lord. You're going to endure some suffering, but you can get through it. You can overcome it. You're not going to be talk, the talk of the town. You might be the talk of the town just in a very negative way, but you'll get past that. And, and lastly, you can't stand for mess. You have to stand against it. Right? If, if you don't do anything about it, it's going to get worse. When you read the whole book of Corinthians, things were pretty rough in that church. People were arrogant. Um, people didn't like each other. People were causing division. People were having relationships with their stepmother. It was crazy. But Paul dealt with everything. And, and if it didn't get dealt with, he was like, I'm coming down to deal with it. Why? Because the gospel is important. Transformed lives are important. This cannot be a lie. This has to be truth. So Paul lived a life. And if we're going to live as Christians, we got to do the same thing. You got to deal with stuff head on. You got to confront it. You got to deal with it and let God do some great things with it. Now, in dealing with it, what's going to come is, is some craziness. You might get talked about. You might get lied about. But you know what? It's worth it if people get changed for the gospel. All right, let's pray. Lord, we come to you right now thanking you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you there is none like you. We pray, Father Lord, that we can be like Paul, Father. Share the truth of the gospel in a way that is bold, a way that is clear, and a way that is true. We pray above all things, Lord, that you would be glorified. Help us, Lord, to endure any hardship that may come in our lives, Lord, because it will come for the sake of the cross. But help us to endure and push past it. Help us, Lord, to, to see that we are no better than anyone, Father Lord. Help us not to judge, Father Lord, but help us to love one another grace, graciously and mercifully and teach truth to one another. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.